Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm Pastor Brian, and this is my friend, my brother, my fellow church member, my co-laborer in ministry, Bruce Peters. Uh, We call this our 4G podcast. Uh, The G stand for gathering with God's people. The second one is to grow in our relationship with him. And Bruce, you and I were just talking about spiritual growth is intentional. It's not automatic. The third is to give, to give what God's given to us. That includes our spiritual gifts. But the fourth value I really want to shine the spotlight on today, and that's going with the gospel. And here at Edgewood, we talk about going with the gospel to our neighbors and to the nations. And Bruce, you have a heart for both of those, uh, don't you? And so I thought we'd start, Bruce, just by telling us a little bit about you and Kathy. Like, how long have you been coming to Edgewood? We've been at Edgewood now a little over three years. Uh, We became members in June uh, 21. So uh, it's it's been really a great time. We well, we love having together. you here. You're, you're, a, you're a member who's serving. You jumped in. Uh, Bruce, we were just talking about discipleship, and this might be a good time to talk about that. You were trying to discern where the Lord would have you serve. You were in a gospel preaching church. You've, yes. had, you've had great training over the years, all the way back in Chicago. I remember part of your story, parachurch ministry. And uh, I think you were watching a service on Cozy TV, and tell us what happened there. Well, I heard some guy on Cozy TV, and he was uh, a a well-known pastor uh, in the local area, and he was talking about uh, discipleship. And uh, he held up a book, Growing in Christ, which is a Navigator's (laughs) Material book, and uh, emphasizes uh, scripture memory. Uh, it just so happens we use this book in our jail ministry right now in Rock Island County. <clears throat> but uh, that was what I led me to check out that church. It happened to be Edgewood. It was Brian. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I just said uh, that's something that really my heart uh, burns for is, uh, is discipleship. And a church that is focused on the primary hallmarks that I think a biblically functioning church that is working uh, has evangelism and discipleship both mm. as its heartbeat. Mm. The teaching, of course, is is very yeah. the, the real backbone, but the actual working within the body is comprised of both evangelism and discipleship. Bruce, flesh that out a little bit, because if you just have one, it's not enough, is it? If it's just evangelism without any discipleship, and if you just have discipleship with no outreach, to flesh that out a little bit. Well, when I came to Christ, uh, I was attending a very heavily evangelistic church, and that was one of the main reasons is because I was attracted to the gospel uh, by the message itself. Well, there was a lot of uh, things that the Lord had done prior to that. But evangelism was the main thrust of the church, but they also invested in small group ministry Mm. and emphasized discipleship using books like Growing in Christ. So getting involved with a small group and growing in Christ was not an option. It was really pointed to as uh, a part of their philosophy Mm. of ministry, Mm. and it was clearly identified as a part of that. Mm. So that's just... that's. All part of you now. It's part of your spiritual DNA. Um, You're passionate about both evangelism and discipleship. Absolutely. Uh, Evangelism is something that we can do anywhere and everywhere. Uh, And God God gives us many opportunities, I believe, to as long as we're available Uh, and uh, we're prepared uh, because sometimes we miss uh, opportunities like that. But I think I'll be in a small group probably until the day I die. <laughs> that's, will, that's, been my, that's been my that's been my life story since I came to Christ oh, was man. was discipleship is obviously a lifelong process. And, and and being in a group like Beth and I lead a growth group tonight, you know, and, and we know each other. We hold each other accountable. Come. We know when somebody dies, like your dad, your both of your parents. When, when you go through life together uh, that that helps conform us to Christ, doesn't it? And 
Um, so I'm with you there. There's a, a lot of people at Edgewood in a growth group. And if you're not in a group, uh, this is the time to jump in. You are made for community. Bruce, I want to come back to something that I've actually learned from you is the importance of always being prepared. Uh, first Tim or First Peter chapter three says, "Always be prepared to give an answer, right, for the reason, for the hope that's within us." And when I think of that verse, that's verse fifteen of First Peter three, I think of you. So, <laughs> no, I do because you seem to always be prepared. I know you'll say you're not, right? Sometimes you miss the opportunity, but for the most part, you go into a conversation, a locker room, the bank in the community, hoping and praying that you'll have a gospel conversation. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, uh, in my, in my time in the morning with the Lord, I know that he's already got an agenda. And I think that's one thing I just (laughs) say, Lord, what's on your agenda today? And I, I, so when I wake up and I was like, uh, and then there's there's a worship element, and then it's just being open to where the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit wants to do that particular day. Maybe it's initializing a spiritual conversation with someone, and and that's something I've got a lot more comfortable with over the the time uh, since I've been a, a believer. But there's always uh, an opportunity if I'm not distracted or if I'm not in a rush mm. in my day-to-day activity. So I'm, I'm essentially praying that the Lord will not only open my eyes to these opportunities, but help me focus on the agenda that he has that day. Wow. So you actually say that out loud when you wake up. Lord, what's your agenda? What do you have for me today? Exactly. Okay. So do you mind fleshing this out a little bit? I know you go to the why. So let's say now you're driving to the why. What And kind of take us in locker room and your workout. Like, what are you looking for? What are you listening for while you're there? Well, I, I play pickleball. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we do a lot in that in wintertime between... Uh, October and April, well, we do a lot of that indoors at the YMCA. So there's a community of people. Mm-hmm. I, I getting plugged into a community. I met a lot of Edgewood people, right? a lot of great people all together, but a lot of neat people that uh, that I found that go to Edgewood that were participating there as well. But anyway, uh, developing those relationships, and I think that's one of the keys is getting just by. A recreational sport uh, and building those relationships, uh, you have more or less a platform uh, when you're, you know, just sitting down waiting for a game to open up and just getting to know the individual and maybe having short conversations. But uh, the opportunity really expands as you develop those relationships and you get to know in a like in a locker room type environment where uh there's always there's superficial conversation but there's also opportunities to go a little bit deeper and ask spiritual questions and that's where i think the holy spirit uh is directly moving and drawing people and even as those spiritual conversations, if there's something like just recently Easter, you can give invitations to to come to like a Easter yeah, service. Yeah, that's kind of an easy one, right? Yeah. Because then somebody it's, could say, well, I don't go to church. Well, now you now know something maybe you didn't know before. Yeah. Or they're like, oh, maybe I will go. Yeah. Or they've just stopped going. They, they stopped. were going. Maybe there's some hurt there. And some there's pain. some church pain. Yes. And they're trying to recover. They're in a process of recovery. And I'll okay. say, uh, well... Um, here's a church that's that's a really good church that I've been a part of three years, and uh, there's a great pastor. <laughs> I think you're going to really enjoy it. And I think, uh, you know, we'd love to have you join my wife and I. Excellent. Um, Bruce, before we started recording, you were talking about uh, a conversation you had with somebody at the Y and I think the day before or previously, uh, you had maybe more of a surfacey conversation. 
um, but you were starting to build kind of a bond, a friendship, and then the next day or shortly after, he asked you a pretty significant question. Do, do you remember yeah. what that was? His name is George, and he was really, uh, really concerned about, he's like 94, <laughs> and he's okay. really thinking about eternity. And I, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking of their eternal destiny to some degree or another. But he asked me one day, he says, and he knew a little bit about my background from uh, mission trips to the Philippines. He just said, uh, what really happens to you after you die? <laughs> Inside you might, you must have been like, okay, Lord, here we go. Now, that doesn't happen very often, right. but it happened that yeah. day. Yeah. And it just opened up a real gospel opportunity. <laughs> So I was really thankful for that. Yeah, um, it, it's it's the uh, I'm trying to remember how somebody worded this. It's like proximity combined with love and care, opportunities come out. But if we're not, it's like do you remember a book years ago called Out of the Salt Shaker? Yes, and Rebecca Pippert. Rebecca Pippert, and the the title and the picture says the whole thing. Like salt is made to be in contact, right? And if we're just in the salt shaker, if we're just here at Edgewood, you know, enjoying each other, yeah. uh, that's not why we're here. We're called to get out, to get out of the salt shaker. Exactly. Uh, the scripture says, what good is uh, the salt if it loses its saltiness? In mm -hmm. other words, if it gets stale, if it's, if it's not being used properly, if it's not being uh, given out, then it basically becomes non-functional or mm -hmm. useless. useless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was one of the first uh, first books that I read on evangelism, and uh, there's many good ones, and uh, uh, that was uh, kind of a challenge um, to to get involved in relationships. Mm -hmm. And and in the work, in the marketplace environment, it's a lot different now, I think, because, because of uh, the woke movement and everything that happens in the marketplace, but used to be opportunities to talk to people at least on breaks, and we used to have noontime Bible studies. And uh, it's a little uh, bit difficult now, isn't it? Depending I, I, on where you are. Yeah, I've been retired, but I I uh, I can only imagine that this. I mean, it was difficult then. I'm not saying this was easy by any chance. You had to be plant. You had to be strategic. You had to be <laughs> right. careful, wise, intentional. <laughs> yeah. You had to be prayerful and, and to really, because you really wanted to have an impact, but mm -hmm. but you had to be strategic, <clears throat> tactical in how you go about doing it. And uh, nowadays, I, I can only imagine, you know, depending upon the corporate environment, and uh, that that would be probably even more challenging. Harder. Yeah, Bruce, I know one of your. Um, I don't want to call it a method, but but I guess we could call it a method, is the use of questions. Uh, one of the uh, more recent books I read on evangelism was called Questioning Evangelism. It's not like questioning its effectiveness. It's the idea of using questions, which Jesus did. Talk to us about that and maybe an example of how you have seen uh, using questions break down some barriers and lead into a gospel conversation. Sure. Um, so as you meet some, let's say somebody you're talking to that you've never met, um, and it maybe is just about, you know, the Purdue Boilermakers playing the Yukon, or you're talking mm -hmm. about sports, or yeah. you're talking about the, uh, the eclipse, or right. what, something, something current, yeah. something current, and, uh, or something that's just basically on a somewhat superficial level, but <clears throat> you want to transition it, uh, eventually at some point in the conversation, you might say something like, "Do you believe in an afterlife?" Hmm. Uh, and and the person might say, "Yeah." Uh, and then the next question would be, "Well, do you believe in heaven?" And so I guess so. Or do you believe in hell? I don't know. Uh, and based on the answers to some of the questions, you know what type of questions to ask nice. beyond that. Nice helps so, you discern where the person's at. Yeah, you get a sense of the spiritual journey. Uh, sometimes you could just maybe ask a even more general, where are you? Where do you feel you're at on your spiritual journey? Isn't or that where, a good question? Uh, that's, that's in double E, in evangel way back when, under uh, Dr. Um, 
Kennedy. Kennedy, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Kennedy, it was like a question that you would just always ask. Uh, yep. Where are you on your spiritual journey? Yep. And that's so much better, Bruce, than if if I'm not a Christian and you come up and you say, hey, Brian, are you a Christian? I'm going to say yes, yeah. even though I'm not, right? Yeah. yeah. But when you say, where are you at in your spiritual journey? Yeah. Well, now yeah. I might say like, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to go to church. You might hear like good works in me. Exactly. And then that helps you go, okay, he needs to understand grace, yeah. right? It helps you then formulate how you're going to reply. Exactly. Uh, and from a scriptural point of view, like in Acts 10, there's this Roman centurion. His name is Cornelius. Mm-hmm. And he's basically uh, a God-fearer. It was what's described as a God-fearer. And he is uh, respectful of all the Jewish rites and customs. and But he's not accepted as a true member of the Jewish community at that point. Right, yeah. So... Uh, we, we, we find out that eventually, uh, the angel that directs him toward Peter and he follows, of course, that leading from the angel precisely. And Peter, fortunately, (laughs) uh, after having a vision, after pondering and then dealing with what God has revealed to him, uh, follows the instructions exactly offers hospitality to the men that come to his house and follows up on what he uh, is being told to do. And uh, eventually, there's a huge breakthrough in the church because they're actually uh, uh, a crossover now from the Jewish uh, evangelism that had been taking place with the apostles, branching out over into the Gentile world. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Bruce, one of the uh, other things that hits me, I mean, God God really got Cornelius's attention, right, with the food and, and all of that. Um, you also have really been helped by resources. So what, what do you like to have on hand when you're talking to people or in your car or somewhere? Well... <laughs> There's a couple of great tracks, a couple that you've written that I love to use. Uh, there's there's one uh, called What Do You Believe? And it's got maybe 12 or four, 14 different road signs pointing to everything that it's so confused. You get the idea, like, what do I, in this world of... of uh, pluralism which one which way do mm. i choose mm. so i can talk about in today's world everybody wants to have a different pathway and there is many pluralistic opportunities but there is a way that seems right to everyone but in the way it leads to death okay so um, having that tool you might pull that out for a certain yeah. individual uh, yeah. someone else you might give a short little booklet like the one on soul satisfaction. If it's so short, you can hand it to somebody. And then other times I've seen you give out Anchor for the Soul. I mean, you have you have a lot of those copies. So is it just a matter of just being resourced and then just see which one will work the best? Again, it depends on the individual. It depends mm-hmm. on the setting. In the jail, we give out Anchor for Your Soul. Um, with your latest release, the, a wonderful resource is the Ready or Not. And... That's something I am just beginning to use. And I think uh, using that tool, because it really gets people thinking about their spiritual destiny, but it also makes people begin to put things together, what, what's really happening right now, and it brings a personal, a personal involvement sure. to, to the situation uh, of, well, where... Where do I really stand? Mm-hmm. Or, or what? I mean, it causes some self exam, minimally yeah. some self examination. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, and and I, you know, who knows how the Holy Spirit is going to work? I mean, there's a thousand different ways. Particularly uh, with, uh, uh, he's referring to that booklet, ready or not. Um, there's a lot of mm-hmm. apocalyptic concern right now in our culture, right? With Absolutely. The advance of a with advance of AI and mm-hmm. what's going on in Israel and. Just the uncertainty, all the wars, and and all the unsettledness in our major cities. People are like, "What's going on?" 
Absolutely. And so that that booklet was written as a way to to identify with that fear, if you will, or at least interest, like, what does the Bible say about end times? And am I ready? If Jesus were to come back today, am I ready or not? And it, if anything, it, again, promotes the spiritual conversation, uh, maybe on a follow-up, if you happen to see that individual within the next week or so, uh, you've got a basis to jump into another spiritual conversation yes. yeah. just based on uh, maybe they've, they've not even had a chance to read it. But you could just say, did you catch the, the part there on page eight where it was talking about um, what it means to abide? Yeah. Uh, I mean, something very, very simple or something that basically would say no, but then you can, that's a lead in that you could talk about what really struck you about that. Bruce, book. just sitting here, um, I'm just filled with, um, with love for you and your approach. And it hits me. You're not this like angry evangelist telling people, <laughs> you know, you're, I, I just the way you talk about people and the way you talk to people is respectful. And I think that's a key part, isn't it? That we we need to be respectful. I think back to the Easter message when after Peter failed and we read that Jesus looked at him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we we made the point that Jesus looked at him with love and and so way to go Bruce. I can when you talk about this, you have so much love for Christ. You have love for lost mm-hmm. people. You have love for the scriptures, and you you want people to get it. And you know, Paul says the love of Christ compels us, right? That we're ministers of reconciliation. So I just want to give you props. I see that in you, Bruce. Well, thank you, thank you, I, and I just thank God because it's all all praise to Him because it's Second Corinthians says that if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Mm-hmm. The old me <laughs> would simply cave into fear. And I think that's a knee-jerk, that's a knee-jerk human, probably one of the biggest objections to evangelism within the church, or historically has been at least, uh, is, is our, our human reaction to cave into fear. And um, again, in a biblically functioning community, we try to encourage and um, bless others that we have this privilege. I mean, right now, we are living in a time that has never preceded us with the situation in Israel as of October 7th that has, you might say, the genie's out of the bottle now, and it's we're never going to go back and we can see the forces that are gathering right now and across the globe against Israel. And things are coming, as a lot of people say, things are coming together. So God, it's almost as if God's giving us a window of time right now. And it's I, as your sermon this weekend, it's one of the things, five things in Ephesians 5, is making the most of our time, Psalm 90, teach us to number our days aright, that we might gain a heart of wisdom. So by being prepared, uh, again, going back to what you were saying is like, yeah, being prepared, because I think people just want hope. Uh, they they want to know that there's really hope for this world because Amen. they're they're not seeing it in government. They're not seeing it in uh, local leadership. They're not seeing it in politics. They're not seeing it... Uh, wherever they're looking, uh, they're not seeing it in corporate culture anymore. Uh, they know things are, are very, very changing. Even the materialistic world, I think, to some degree, has fallen flat for mm-hmm. some. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not all, but uh, that those things are temporary and never satisfy. You're, uh, you're applying the message that we all learned <clears throat> last week. Make the most of every opportunity, um, not because the days are short, but because the days are evil. Evil, right? and yeah. and the evil as it goes up, we can, we can lament, and we should, right? But if that's all we do, that's not enough. We we have to give the gospel out because it's the gospel that changes Absolutely. lives. It's uh, it's the heartbeat of what we're talking about. Is the gospel that changes lives? It's <laughs> it's the gospel that makes the difference. It's the gospel 
that will change the trajectory, the actual <laughs> eternity of an individual's life. Yeah. And I can't, I can't think of anything more exciting than what the Lord's already Amen. <laughs> called, exactly. called us to do if we're just o- aware of, of the, the, co- the Great Commission and we're just following up and being obedient to what God's already called us to do. Listener, you're, you're hearing some things from Bruce here, some themes that I'll just uh, kind of pull out that come to my mind. Bruce, you talk a lot about intentionality. Uh, you talk a lot about prayer, getting yourself ready as the day goes. Lord, what do you have for me? Uh, you talk about the use of questions. You, you've mentioned um, fear, right, as something that holds people back. And I think the more you do this, the more we, um, we embrace the gospel in our own lives, then we can't help but tell people the gospel. And Bruce, let's transition a bit here in, and talk about how God's opened up a jail ministry here. And I'm sure mm. there's some challenges. I've heard oh. some great reports. There's, there's all those challenges. What happened during COVID when we couldn't go in? And, uh, but could you just give us some highlights there and how that's like another extension of your passion for evangelism and discipleship? I think it was about 2006, uh, I was involved in a parachurch ministry called Grow Ministry, very active ministry, primarily to women, uh, and they were actually going into the jail already in Scott County, well, both Scott County and Rock Island County, but uh, their primary focus was at Scott County, but they didn't have anyone doing men ministry and going into the jail there, and uh, they asked me if I would be interested in contacting the administrator there uh, for an application to possibly go in and start uh, some type of a ministry. So I explored it, and I found out that after three visits with a pastor who was going in uh, with uh, opportunities to share with the inmates there, I could actually go in on my own on a Saturday. And I discovered this great thing. It's a DVD with worship music. And I thought, boy, this is great for jail ministry. It's like we could worship, and before we even start our message and our conversations, Mm -hmm. and it worked. Kind of set the tone. Set the tone. Your focus heavenward. Exactly. And I I just, I learned so much from that. So I did that for a couple of years. And then I got involved in the Rock Island County Jail. uh, And that was a kind of a different style of, of ministry because it was a little less, a lot less structured. It was more, um, involved with uh, a partner that I they had. We went out in twos. There was men and women, and we had a small group. I think maybe there was five or six of us, and we would go and minister every week uh, to someone in the Rock Island County Jail. Well, we did that for about four years, and then COVID hit in uh, 2020, and uh, we were shut down from March of 2020 until March of last year. Now, I didn't, at that point, it was so long, that's over, it's about three years. It's that a long time. There was no jail ministry, and I was, uh, I was kind of uh, kind of broken up about that because that, that was something, obviously, I'd been doing altogether maybe about six years at that time. So when it came, when, when, I, uh, when I had got back from a trip and I had started talking to the county sheriff again about getting in, uh, he just said all I had to do was file an application, and he could get me back in. And so I did. And then it was just a question of trying to get a partner. And you probably remember this. Uh, one day after one of the, the sermons, uh, ran across uh, a another believer who was eventually through conversations became interested in joining me in the ministry. So to this day, now one year later, uh, we're doing ministry it's you together. And it's you and it's Mike and I. Um, I, I don't remember the exact details, but <clears throat> Mike had just started coming to Edgewood. And, exactly. and uh, the Lord, I mean, he's, he's tender like you. I mean, he's reading scripture and you can see tears in his eyes. And 
And he's like, man, I, he's got a I soft just, heart. he's got a very soft heart. And I, I remember after a service, it was a Saturday night service and you and Kathy are often in Saturday night as yeah. well. And he's like, I don't know what God has for me. And, and I, and I don't remember if he brought up the, of the word jail ministry, but he certainly wanted to serve. And I'm, yeah. I'm thinking he, he was, op- he said something that was open to that, but Anyway, I remember connecting him to you that night. You were in the aisle at church, and you guys just started talking, right? right? Yeah, you brought us, you you got us connected together, uh, and I think the Holy Spirit. I could see that the Holy Spirit was basically kind of pointing us towards something else, and so we we kind of threw out a fleece uh, there at that point to see if an application for Mike would get approved, and after I don't know another two, three weeks, yeah, he got approved. But you know, <laughs> ever since then, they've drawn a line. They won't let any more volunteers. That's so it's where just you and Mike? It's just Mike and I, and uh, we we uh, we have been carrying uh, 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 the load for over a year. And uh, there's, there's plenty of room, but you're always, cons- it seems like there's a lot of restrictions now that the jail has placed on us that is stop further growth. And that's that's kind of a... But you're getting the gospel in there. That's Friday nights? <laughs> Friday nights is yep. when we go and... Because I remember and... hearing some reports here of people mm-hmm. reading Anchor for the Soul and somebody coming to Christ as a result. Do I have that right? Absolutely. I, last year? I was passing out... <laughs> I remember passing out the book uh, and it's, you know, Spanish or English because some guys are bilingual, but... One guy said, I've already read that. He wouldn't take it because I've already read it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that book yeah. is out in so many different and ways. And it's in yeah. the jail. It's in the jail life. I mean, there's many copies. Um, uh, I think Larry brought some copies over and got. Uh, there's a lot of copies available in the jail library. And Gary and Kathy Pinger, who distribute Anchor for the Soul uh, across the country, they're members here, um, I I was able to make a contact at Scott County Jail, and there's a lot of copies at Scott County, too, in their library now. Gary and Kathy took them over there, so God's using that book in so many different ways. Um, And and, uh, I I keep a copy in my car because you never know who... Uh, you're going to run into that basically Mm -hmm. uh, is going through a storm, going through medical, major medical illness, going through, uh, there's there's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And it just seems that, you know, if you have the answer, uh, not that we do, but that Christ has given us the solution in him, why, why would we not try to not solve the world's problems, but at least give uh, living water to someone who is thirsty and probably doesn't even know it. Wow, Bruce, that was fantastic, and it 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 just reminded me of a, of a story a, a young woman, both you and I know who you met in in kind of a banking uh, situation for you, and um, you both had lost a parent. Yeah. And it's it's that you connect at an at a the connect point there was pain and loss right with a whole bunch of other things and um, yeah. and and sometimes it's somebody's questions sometimes it's their pain sometimes it's uncertainty but needs are there absolutely and people and yeah being available uh, on the spot so to speak to to listen um, to pray to just say. Can I pray with you? Can I? Um, I I hear your pain, <laughs> and I wanna I wanna pray for you. Amen, amen. Well, Bruce, let me pray for you now. Mm-hmm. God, we pause here now, and we thank you for the efforts that you have um, you have just mobilized Bruce to participate in. And Lord, he's he's joining you in what you're doing. And Lord, I pray that you would bless him, Lord, as he. Um, as he wrestles with some health struggles, as he uh, seeks you every day, would you be pleased to use him as a gospel proclaimer? Lord, I think of all the conversations that are out there that he's had already where seeds have been planted. Would you water those and bring forth fruit? 
Lord, as a church, would you mobilize us to uh, care for our neighbors and our coworkers and our classmates and people we know in the community where we exercise or where we hang out. Uh, Lord, help us to live on mission for you. And Lord, also help us to be focused on the world, on the global need for unreached people groups as well. Lord, we pray, continue to pray that you would bring revival to Edgewood and to every gospel preaching church, that you'd fire us up to live all out for you, uh, not for ourselves, but for you and your glory, for the fame of your glorious name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for gathering with us today for our 4G podcast. Uh, Pastor Kyle and I are co-hosting this. Uh, We're thinking next week of maybe doing it together. Uh, Really appreciate how God uses Pastor Kyle in multiple ways. If you find this podcast to be of help, if you could like it, share it, uh, that would help it come up a little higher in the search uh, results for those who maybe have never heard of this podcast before. Until next week, Uh, Keep living on mission and living out your calling for the sake of his glorious name.